I've been asked to ask you not to use flash, please. Thank you. If I may, Mr. Iyengar, I'd like to start by asking you, how important is a sense of humor for a yoga practitioner? If there is no sense of humor, I think that life is not worth living. <laughs> The whole world, the human nature is that, that it wants sense of humor. So we live in sense of humor and that's the way which one's life gets exhilarated to live with happiness. So therefore I say sense of humor is a must even in a philosopher. Excellent, thank you. Uh, in chapter one of your new book, Light on Life, in case you missed it, <laughs> the first chapter is entitled The Inward Journey. You say this, do not forget the word align. It is through the alignment of my body that I discovered the alignment of my mind, self, and intelligence. Alignment from the outermost body, or sheath, kosa, to the innermost is the way to bring our own personal reality into contact with universal reality. I would like to ask you, how and why did you develop your approach to yoga with its emphasis on alignment and use of props? You know, when I started yoga, or when my guru also taught me yoga, It, it was such that they were only saying that you have to do the asanas. And when we asked them for what purpose, the answers were not coming. Just you have to do. Then when I started, of course, as you all know, just to gain health, when I, it took me six years to gain back my health, that my... I never got health immediately after two or three months practice. Though I was a teacher in Pune, I was really an anti-advertisement for yoga. <laughs> because of tuberculosis, my chest, even when I was in Pune in 1937, was not more than 28 inches. Naturally, people used to laugh Say, if you do yoga, you'll be like Miss Anger. <laughs> then I thought that what I have to do to improve, chest cannot develop on account of tuberculosis. The very first class in 1937, first of September, I was the youngest teacher amongst my pupils. They were all elderly, cultured, and they were all from colleges. And I had not even entered the footsteps of a college, so I never knew the behaviors. When people were laughing at my body, but I had taken the responsibility of teaching for six months, because the contract was for six months, I said, that in order to quieten them, I thought, with, with all their muscular bodies, because Pune is famous in those days for malcolm, wrestling, and gym. There are lots of gymnasiums in Pune, compared to any other parts of India. So the classes were from morning 6 to 11, and 4 to 8. I, the only challenge I thought was not to explain about my weaknesses at all. I started doing with all the classes, though I had no energy, in order to show to, and tell them that with all your bulky muscles you cannot withstand 
the amount of strain or the practice what I do. Come on, do with me, let me see. And that is how I started challenging the well-built bodies with a frail body. Then it started that if I have to, because they're all physical culturists who are coming to my class. I thought, then I saw their bulky muscles, you know, biceps, triceps, cough muscles, thighs. Naturally, I thought, from the body angle, I'm not going to convince them at all. <laughs> so at that time, it struck me that when I look at their muscles, I said, see, your forearm is so bulky, but see the shape. I said, your forearm should be like a, like a banana fruit, plantain fruit. You should be run, you should run like that. Somewhere it is thick, somewhere it is thin. And I showed them about the biceps, the inner bank of the biceps short, outer bank long. So when I started telling them, you are all doing it, though I have no muscles, see, no, my, my flesh was as long as a bone. So naturally I could sh show the pride. See my length, outside and I see inside are equal. And that made me to work practically on working on alignment of each and every muscle so that the inner bank and the outer bank of each muscle should run parallel to each other in the presentation of asanas. Then when I touch the muscles, when I say evenness, I used to tell them that the muscle should feel the length of the skin which, because of the bulky muscles, they were not feeling at all, the skin. So that's how I thought I'm one inch above them to explain something. <laughs> and I developed that of aligning the inner bank and the outer bank, the top bank and the bottom bank, how they should be maintained while practicing asanas. That's the first knowledge I got. Afterwards, it took me several years I was only dependent on that one, showing them that if you go, do work in balancing the muscles evenly, I said there will be good health. I was thinking only on physical health at that moment. Then when I went on for about three, four years, I was teaching just like that alone. And my practices are also like, as you all know today, of what you call Vinyasakrama, from 1937 to 1943, I was teaching only the Vinyasa Krama of yoga because my intelligence did not present me anything except alignment. In all the asanas, when I do, when I do Chaturanga Dandasana, I have to find the inner, length of the inner leg, length of the outer leg should be equal. That's how I started explaining. Then, up to 1943, as I said, I was taking Vinyasa Krama. Then the people of Pune asked me, why not you start a remedial class? Lots of people want to learn. When I started, I accepted it, and I started the class. Then I took the Vinyasa Krama. They said, my heart is beating, I can't do this. My head feels hot. I can't do it. So naturally, for the remedial classes, I start. I drop the vinyasa krama, and I started devoting my time to find to trace what their complaints were. And at that time, there was a very famous doctor who invited me to teach in Pune. He was. He had twenty-six. Uh, alphabetical titles in medicine. <laughs> D-O, D-O, F-M-S, F-R-C-S, 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 and so on and so forth. As he had taken the responsibility that as a surgeon, he was a physician and he was a surgeon, he took the responsibility and told the public that I am monitoring his work 
And if anything happens, he said, I will be treating medically, but I want him to teach. Because he had seen me, my demonstration, in 1936 in, in the city of Belgaum, when he was the civil surgeon there. He said, being a medical man, I have not found any of these movements in any anatomy. Though I'm a surgeon, he said, it has moved me and I want to teach you, teach this in these schools and colleges of Pune. That's why I went to Pune. Then being a doctor, while I was teaching, he used to observe and he used to say, do you know anything about anatomy? I said, my Guruji sent me a raw, raw student as a raw teacher he has sent me. Sir, I do not know anything. He said, I will be in all the classes for you and your job is to speak on yoga, my job is to speak on medicine, on the asanas. Then he used to watch me teaching and as I was teaching, he said, your teaching is also almost identical to the medical science. I don't think there is any problem. But you cannot explain, I will explain. So when I was teaching him, he used to make notes in his medical science and he used to give talks in public because he used to arrange demonstrations. Every, every day I used to give performances in Pune and he used to speak. And I started getting knowledge from him regarding anatomy and physiology. Through him I learned a great deal. And when the remedial classes started, the start, they classes alone were very hard for me because I never knew many of the diseases. Regarding props, though I did not introduce, there were the principal of the Ferguson College was a great historian. In 1937, his age was 86. He was suffering from dysentery. And he could not walk, he could not stand, but he was considered as an intellectual person of Pune in those days. So Dr. Gokhale came and asked me, he is suffering from dysentery, can you handle him. It, I was nervous. This is the first medical case I took. I was very nervous because he could not be able to stand and sit. Then I made him to lie down, what you call Uttita Trikonasana. I turned into Supta tri, tri, uh, Trikonasana. I used to make him to lie down, move right leg to the right side, left leg to the left side, turn the trunk with my hand, hold the statch. This way I started learning and I started seeing the movements of the abdominal organs in the Supta Trikonasana, Supta Parsha Konasana, Virabhadrasana. All I used to make him do. And fortunately, his dysentery disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> and that was the success in remedial cases. Then came a lot of cricketers. That's why the book is asking. <laughs> the cricketers had a lot of knee problems, shoulder problems. Then I started working because I knew halasan, interlocking, stretching, how they develop shoulders and how virasan, baddha konasan, how help knee, you know, knees. When I started working, then when they were doing the virasana, I, they... Patella, or the kneecap, were not in shape. It was, it was taking ugly shapes, you know. The four corners of the chips were not exactly in positions. Then I thought I have to learn the alignment of the joints. Then I used to work, you know, keep, keeping fingers on their head of the calf muscles, inside, outside. If I turn out, what happens? If I turn inside, what happens? I never made them to sit, but only kneeling, I started adjusting to find whether I can turn the patella to face exactly the four corners of the knees. And I started learning the alignment this way. Then it took me many years to learn the alignment of the mind with the physical body. When I used to stretch my arms, that's why I can, I exact, so people used to stretch, but only the flesh were far away from their mind. Then I used to tell them, stretch more, stretch more. 
Then when I was, te- I used to stretch along with them. All my classes in the early days were not explanations at all. I used to show once and I used to do along with the class so that they could see me doing because I could not express much in words. So I used to do to, if they ask me, again, come on, repeat, I will also do with you. So while doing, I used to see the defects in my students. I used to keep it in my mind and go home, why this person is doing like, like this in Trikonasana, why one foot is like that, one, one thigh in different directions, then a homework I used to do. I used to imitate all my students' practices on my own. And which muscle resists, in which position, that which muscle resists, which muscle cooperates, I went on learning. And that gave me a tremendous idea to give the ideas of how the mind has to be with the action. We may stretch the flesh, but the mind may not reach there. Then I thought, no, unless the mind reaches, the stretch is not complete. That's how I went on learning and learning. Then, when the mind started touching, the corrections were not coming. I could feel the mind. Then I stretch. Now, you people do not know, when I'm stretching, you do not know where my mind is. But I can tell you, one inch inside, only I know where the mind is going. Whereas if you stretch, you stretch up like that. So your mind is only on the, on the surface of the jarring the skin. So I have to let loose the skin and then I have to stretch. So this way I went on learning. Then I said, how to find out whether I'm doing well or not? So I had to look. Then I had to make my intelligence. Should I turn this way? Should I turn that way? So this way I went on working. And later, of course, after many, many years, it's not in few years, though at that time there were so many yoga teachers, even what little knowledge I had, people say he was the best teacher. Because I was conscientiously working and I was seriously devoting my time to this subject only. Then I thought, I said, let me make, if my hand is about two and a half feet, can I stretch my intelligence also two and a half feet? That means a subtle movement in the inner body. So inner flesh started functioning. When we stretch, we stretch outside the leg. But near the bone, the inner bank of the flesh was not reacting at all. Then through intelligence, I learned that the interior cells of the flesh also can be extended, expanded, contracted. And that gave me that intelligence has to move along with the stretch and contraction. If I contract, the intelligence also should contract only so much according to the frame of the muscle. And that's how I went on learning, learning. And today I've given in light on life that how one can reach that. When you reach that, that you are not doing the physical body, but you are training the intelligence to look at the body and its various vehemence of the body garments of the body. So I made the intelligence to peep into the every pore of my body. And today you, you have seen also that I, that's the way I'm teaching now. So I've enjoyed the fruit. For several years it was raw fruit, never ripe. It took me 30, 40 years to ripe. And then in that ripeness, I started cultivating further and further. Thank you. One of the themes that you circle back to a number of times in the book is the householder's, is the householder's spiritual path. And I'm just going to read you a, a section, and then I would ask you to comment, please. This is in the first chapter uh, under learning to live in the natural world. There's a frequent misunderstanding of the journey inward 
or the spiritual path, which suggests to most people a rejection of the natural world, the mundane, the practical, the pleasurable. On the contrary, to a yogi, or indeed a Taoist master or Zen monk, the path towards spirit lies entirely in the domain of nature. It is the exploration of nature from the world of appearances or surface into the subtlest heart of living matter. Spirituality is not some external goal that one must seek, but a part of the divine core in each of us which we must reveal. For the yogi, spirit is not separate from body. Spirituality, as I have tried to make clear, is not ethereal and outside nature, but accessible and pal palpable in our very own body. Indeed, the very idea of a spiritual path is a misnomer. After all, how can you move towards something which, like divinity, is already by definition everywhere? A better image might be that if we tidy and clean our house enough, we might one day notice that divinity has been sitting in it all along. You know, in 1936, actually in 1934, Paramahamsa Yogananda was in Mysore. He was the first man who told me, come to America and I will see that you will be recognized by all. So I, at that time, I was only 14, 15 years old. He saw, because he was the guest of the Maharaj of Mysore, and Yogoshala belonging to the royal family. So the Maharaja said, this guest has come, he's a yogi, you have to give a demonstration. We were all there, Ivan Patabi, myself and all. And you, as I was young, my guru used to make me do lots of backbends. I don't think at that time, any of my senior students were doing backbends. They were only good in Shishasan, Sarvangasana and Balance. The rest of the asanas I had to perform. So when I demonstrated, he asked Guruji, please send this boy with me to America. Then my Guruji just kept quiet and he came and asked me. I said, no, sir, I cannot come because I got only... He asked me so that I, I want... He said, I can make you a sannyasi. I will initiate you. I said, no, I can't accept only... I got only one Guru as I, my one mother and one father. So I did not accept his invitation at all. Then within three, after two, three years, Swami Shivananda, who saw my practices, said, why don't you come to Divine Life Society? I will initiate you and you can carry on the work. Some or other in my mind, because I was suffering of so much illnesses and relatives sometimes helping me, sometimes cursing me, I thought that we have to live in the family, not to cut off and staying in somewhere as if I'm a holy man. So even for Swami Shivananda, I wrote him a letter at that time saying, Sir, thank you very much for your offer. I would like to live like an ordinary man. As other people live household life, I also would like to follow the same methodology, sorry, I can't have the initiation. Though, till his death, we were very good friends. Though he was a guru for many, for me, he has, he has uplifted me to such an extent, I couldn't call him, but Guruji, except Swamiji. Then I thought that emotional disturbances are more, upheavals of life, is in family life, not in a sannyasi's life. So sannyasis have no problems at all. <laughs> they create problems, but actually there are no problems. <laughs> then I thought, is yoga meant only to practice when one cannot face the circumstances of life? Then I determined, I said, no, when time comes, I will marry, I will also know the upheavals of life, 
and the behavioral pattern of the partner so that if we can understand each other, we can also talk in the same language to others. That's how I married. And to bring a family through yoga was an impossibility at my time. Today they say commercial. Well, I say that having suffered, I have lived without food for days. I have practiced yoga with tap water for days. That's why people ask me diet. When I had no diet and practice, how can I speak on diet? <laughs> <laughs> so, to bring a family life in the yogic line at that time was very, very difficult. So I had made up my mind not to marry till I settled in life. But circumstances, because my guru also suspected that I may not be having a character that he is refusing to be a family man. So story started in my family saying he may not be having a character, he's 600 miles away, God alone knows how he lives. <laughs> For that sake, in order to stop their mouth, I accepted to marry. And dire poverty taught me lots of things. And that educated me that even in poverty, when I was practicing, it gave me a knowledge that poverty is the garland of knowledge. So that poverty made me to work hard to penetrate this subject. And I certainly interviewed my heart and head into each asana and today you are all benefiting out of it for which I am happy. Unless and until we understand the human emotion, how can we go towards divinity? Therefore I married and I understood the relationship, human relationship and from that human relationship, can we transform that human relationship into a divine relationship? And that self-ideas struck me. And I learned a great deal. Though I have say, said even day before yesterday that I am in white clothes, but I am a sannyasi inside. So this emotional upheaval of people taught me to be compassionate and friendly. Though, people call me that I'm a harsh man. Even today, I think in a class, I hit somebody very strong because he was not listening to what I was saying. <laughs> yeah, parents look after the children. Sometimes they beat. They hit. Do you mean it is that uh, cruel or it is a compassionate hit? So this also with me, I began teaching, educating my students to come to that level and to accept this as a friendly hit. So this practice went on. When it went on, then when I started developing, I said, who, who is this one who is seeking for so many things? The seeker is also the subject. The seeker alone also is an object. The seeker is also an instrument. What is this going on? That is how I started developing that the subject changes into a thing and object. And object makes us to think that there is something beyond this object. So we have to search that. It took me several years and I realized that the same I is behaving as a seeker, a seer, a searcher, and so on and so forth. That's why I said in the book that the seer is the seeker, the seeker is the seer. If we realize that it is we who have created the division or barricading, the seer is a seeker, and I learned 
that let me not see as a seeker, let me see everything as a seer. And that gave me the knowledge that there is no difference between physical body, mental body or spiritual body. You know, this is a glass container. Can you store water if there is no glass? So similarly, this body is a container and if the container is tilted, even the content inside gets tilted. And that one which tilts the seeker, I hope you understand. So the, this is known as what we call fluctuation, oscillations and all. Then I learned that if the container is stable, the content inside the container should also be stable. And the content inside is energy and the other one is a life force. It may be Atma, it may be energy, which I was not knowing at that time. So while doing the asana, how I realize, I, if the container is straight, the water follows the container. If it's round, the water occupies the round shape of the pot. If it's oval shape, it takes a oval shape. So that gave me the idea that when I'm doing the asana, whether it's Trikonasana, Gandhavirundasana or Rishikasana, the container size is the same. The container do not change in the asana. So as the container is the same, though the container I'm shifting, can I make the content not to shake in each and every asana so that the container and the content are in contact with each other. And that is how I developed that there is no difference between body, mind and soul. And I treated everything as self. How can, a, how can the self seek? Where is the ambition for the seer? The ambition is for its agents. For the soul, the soul's agents have ambitions. But the soul has no ambition. So it takes long time to understand these things. So from practical point of view, the philosophy, I learned that even people say, why are you greedy? Then I learned, on, a, on account of my poverty, I learned that the difference between need and greed, we can use the word greed. So even in yogic practices, if I go on, go on adding ambitions, today I did for my, for my tuberculosis, I improved my tuberculosis, now I think I should build up muscles. I say I will build up muscles. Then what next? No, I should understand what is mine. Is it not? So ambitions went on increasing in the early days of my practice, one after the other. Then I thought, God has given, gave me to practice yoga in order to get rid of tuberculosis. When I'm, I improved my health, I got rid of tuberculosis. Is it fair on my part to go for second ambition? I thought, let me not have ambition. Though in the early days, I was a, my practice of yoga is also a mercenary, to be honest. Because I have to look after my family. I have to earn. So, I, it was a mercenary to me for nearly 15, 20 years. But still I did not stop, I continued and it worked as me as a mercenary. Mercantize, what do you call it? You know? So for me yoga was a mercantize for nearly 20 years to maintain my family. Then, when I started thinking like that, then I developed the quality of understanding the emotional intelligence. That's why I said, I said, four chambers of the heart, four chambers of the head, which I don't think we will find any, uh, in any 
textbooks these days. How it guided me. How I should be friendly to my body. How should I be compassionate to my body. How I should be, I should enjoy, enjoy when the body presents something. And in that level, I learn. Not what I am speaking today. Then, when I guide the health, I said, I, should I show indifferent? You know, everybody says, be indifferent to the body. I said, no, I should be indifferent when it commands over me. Not before. So that's why I use the tarka vichara of the head in order to control the ambitions of the heart. So I went on balancing and continued practice and I reversed the, my methodology. Everybody wants to do for something because at that time students were coming to me, I am suffering from this diet, I am suffering. Even to tell you the fact, I never knew what sex life was at the age of 18, 19 because we have no education in India. A couple came to me and said, suppose I do yoga, can we have a pragani? Can we have a child? Foolishly, you know, after all, I'm not an intellectual. I don't know what happened to me. I said, if, you all, if both of you practice for six months, I think God will grace you a child. <laughs> I did say, <laughs> and the, the husband said, I'm not suffering from anything, I don't need yoga, because the doctors have examined me, nothing wrong, so it is the defect in my wife, you teach my wife. <laughs> then the problem came to me, I said, I promised that, that she will carry within six months, and the husband says, I will not do. I coaxed him, he just said, no, I am perfect. But I want you to teach my wife and I should get a child. Anyhow, I said I promise that I will teach whether both of them do or not. But at least the, the, the female party, partner was ready to do. I continued. Believe me or not, in six months she conceived. <laughs> no, I said if I had taken that line Probably, I would have lost the path. Still, I will tell you the stories. That's why many people do not know. Then, at the time of delivery, say, God helped me. It was a stillborn child. Then the husband came and asked me, well, you promised me a child. See, what happened? I asked you to do it. You did not do it. So God honored my word. He gave you a still child. If you had done it yoga, you would have got a healthy child. I escaped by saying. <laughs> then, for your own information, you all know Ajil Palkiwala. His mother had seven, eight abortions. So they came to yoga. Miscarriages. Miscarriage. They came to you. Then the, somebody said, you know, Mr. Tarapural, of whom you all read in, book, in my books. He said, come to yoga and practice. So both husband and came both asked me, can we have a child? I said, if both of you practice, because that experience I had. <laughs> so I said, if both of you do, God will definitely bless you. And it was in 1950s. I, both of them were coming to class regularly and they got the child ideal. And that's why you all say, I know yoga from the birth. Then she conceived second time. I was in England. The doctor said, it's a fluke. Adil's birth was a fluke. It's impossible for you. Your, it, your uterus cannot carry at all. 
Then, miscarriage took place when I was in England. Doctors laughed. Saying, we told you that you cannot. And later, of course, they were continue the class because of their faith that they got a child. And afterwards, they got two more sons. And I, they got three sons. And believe me, I, afterwards, she went for an operation, not to have children. I said, you are going to get <laughs> next year daughter. I said. <laughs> now I'm telling... Because how I lived innocently, though these things happened. Then in 1940, I lost my job. There was a conference, industrial conference in Pune. I lost my job. So somebody asked me, can you give a demonstration for this industrial exhibition? I said, I will give. And because I had only two days work, I did it. I thought, somebody told me that if somebody gets interest, if they ask you, would you teach, take private lessons? I said, any other to survive, let me see. I accepted it. I gave a demonstration. And in the demonstration, one of the publishers came and asked me, by doing yoga, can I get a male child? <laughs> I was not married still. I, that's also you should know. And he had three daughters. <laughs> and he had three daughters. And he came and asked me, Billy, can I have a son? And immediately I said, so if you and your wife practices for three years, you will have a son. <laughs> and 1940, I started teaching him. And my marriage was in 1943 and it was in July 1943 my marriage and he got a son in May 1943. <laughs> and that's how my faith in yoga went on increasing. But I did not use it. But I did not use that to make money saying, yes, I've got power. Even today if you go to Pune, Rastaspet, where I was staying in 1937, there are some Iranian hotels round about. And you are, go there and say, there is a man sitting in this hotel. Whatever he says comes true. I never knew. What is that? They used to come. Sir, can you give me a, one number within ten? I was not knowing at all. Why are they asking? <laughs> so I used to give number. And then next day they say, sir, we won a lot of money. I didn't know why. How? I said, no, that we don't tell you. What is the next? Can you give me today one number? Every Saturday. The, race were, the races were there in Pune. And Saturday, these Iranians were used to come and ask me, what is the Can you give me a number one in ten? And then it spread. It spread. There is a miracle man in, in this hotel. And there was also American cotton exchange in those days. Opening and closing. You know, you went to range, <laughs> share bazaar, it is there. Opening figure, closing figure. And if the opening, closing figure was accurate, they were getting, um, uh, for one rupee, if they are correct, they were getting 88 rupees. If opening is correct, 8 rupees. If opening and closing was correct, 88 rupees. So they used to ask me, in 100, give me number. So I used to give numbers. And they used to say every time. Then I said, what is happening to me? And that day, I closed my mouth. I said, I will not give anybody. I know nothing. <laughs> and that is how I came to a practical line. Otherwise, it was a tempting time. That whatever I say is coming true, I would have also said, let me try. But I did not do it. So I took this way. So like this, I think yoga created faith in me to work on my own, to find out, but keeping my mind away from aims or ambitions, receive from what it gives to you, rather than you asking the, from the art. So I followed the other way, and I think you are all benefiting on account of that today. <laughs> and you can, and one day, one day, 
you are going to experience what I said now, that there is no difference between the container and the content, the content and the container, both you will experience as if it is one. Okay, uh, I'm going to go to chapter three. Uh, the title of chapter three is Vitality, the Energy Body. And you discuss, among many things, the six emotional disturbances, being lust, anger, greed, obsession, yes, yes. pride, and hatred. Okay. So I'd like to go right to the section on lust. <laughs> okay. When I was a young man, I had to fight to keep my integrity. Virtue is an ideal. Integrity is a reality. I did not want to divide myself. I'm skipping a little bit here. Later on, when I was married and teaching abroad, I was exposed to temptation. It's normal for women students to set their teacher on a pedestal in any subject, but by that time, I was a bit more worldly wise and developed a forbidding manner to keep them at arm's length. My flashing eyebrows and fierce glare came to my rescue. <laughs> so my question is, you are famous for your flashing eyebrows and your fierce glare as a teacher. And I suspect you use your fierce glare for more reasons than to fend off overly friendly female students. <laughs> You know, the man faces lots of temptations in life. And I was a public performer in yoga. I do not think any yogi in the world has given public performances as I have given. And in my say, 1960s, probably my body had built up so well that it's not a question of um, muscular body, it was the elegance in the muscles which used to attract lots of women. <laughs> and being a stage performer, I had these temptations. People used to come, if I do it Virabhadrasana, see, I would like to kiss your leg, you do it stretch so well. <laughs> I have not said all these things now I have to say, because <laughs> questions are coming. So keeping that behind, I have written. What I had I underwent in my life, <laughs> and even very rich women who were lonely used to talk to me <laughs> at that time you know I had also good experiences of lots of spiritual teachers whom I was also teaching yoga I learned from them that, what, that I should not do what they do. So that was the guidance. So they are also my gurus. Because I learned from them that I should not do the way they behave. And as the temptations were increasing as a solo performer and performing artist in yoga, you will not find any, another performing artist for, for centuries to come. It was really hard that the temptations were so much, though I had to develop artificial anger. I said, better show little anger so that they get frightened. <laughs> and sometimes the temptations also used to say, you know, you have no money, why don't you accept it? But then I, my inner mind was fighting. If I fall a prey, what happens to my practice? I may make a little money, but 
my subject is going to be died. So better stick to, stick to poverty, but stick to the subject, but do not fall a victim. It's all my inner guidance which came. So some youngsters, in the, of course, they were all, according to them, some beautiful women, used to ask me, may I come and talk to you uh, privately? So even somebody suffering some, something, can I come and talk to you privately? So I used to tell them, I have no special rooms for you. So if you want to talk to me, I will stay in this corner. The others can be sitting there. You come and talk to me so that nobody can say that what happened inside the inner room. I was so much frightful in those days because of the temptations. And these youngsters used to call me for lunch, dinner. So I used to tell them, why don't you call some others along with me so that no stories can come. This is how I saved my life. <laughs> I, I saved my energy. <laughs>